Welcome to the Washington Stormwater Center's Lunchtime Municipal Webinar Series. Today, we welcome Steve Hitch from the City of Redmond, who will be sharing with us the City of Redmond's Watershed Recovery Plan. Please enjoy the presentation. Steve, it's now up to you. Welcome, everybody. Great. Thank you, Lori. Uh, again, this is Steve Hitch with the City of Redmond. We're here to talk about Redmond's watershed approach to recovering urban streams, specifically talking about developing and implementing our watershed management plan. If you're joining us today, I assume you are aware of our, the situation we have in Puget Sound with our ailing salmon populations. So coho, chinook, steelhead, all of our fish populations in Puget Sound really have been declining and, have, and all on the coast since the late 70s and into the early 80s. And it continues to be a major problem for us. And so what we'd like to see is more healthy aquatic habitat, but most of that has disappeared where the people live and work. So the savior for that should be our stormwater management techniques, right? So building our treatment facilities, our flow control facilities, and now low impact development. We've been thinking that this would be the way that we would solve these problems for our fish. But as you know, development prior to really 2013 isn't up to standards that will meet this goal. The flow control and treatment until very recently, we find that to be very deficient. And so what do we do about that? The Washington uh, Municipal Stormwater Permit, the, the permits that the cities are, are tied to, the goal of that permit is to, or one of the goals of that permit, is to see that development, new development and redevelopment mitigate some of these impacts from that development. And they don't just mitigate the impacts of the current development, but they try to roll back and improve things uh, even over what the conditions might be on the site today. As that treatment is designed to improve those conditions relative to what's happening in the streams, it's a lofty goal, but it's not working very well. And we're going to talk a little bit about why that's not working and what a different approach can do to improve that. Primarily, the problem is that development projects focus their development where it makes sense to develop. They don't focus on where it makes sense to improve a stream. And so under the current structure, the MPDS permit is telling us we should go out and restore streams wherever it makes sense for development to happen. And I think logic would tell us that it makes sense to improve streams where the streams will see the most benefit, not where it makes the most sense for that development to happen. And so we're looking for a different way. Just a couple of quick reminders about the things that we're trying to solve. So the hydrology situation, uh, that de those development projects, the stream would like there to be a forest around it. And so we build practices downstream of development. We build ponds and vaults to try to slow down the water to try to mimic that forested condition. And that's really important. Uh, as we look at the developed areas, the picture on the right is that developed area. The picture on the left is that, that kind of pre-existing condition. So when you had all the, all the trees and the, the great landscaping in that pre-existing condition, the water is able to soak into the ground. You don't have a lot of runoff. So in the developed areas, there are fewer pathways that water can infiltrate, and that reduces the groundwater infiltration from as high as 40 down to 15%, and reducing evapotranspiration from as high as 50 to 25%. So not only are we putting less water into the ground, but we're letting less water come, you know, go back up into the sky. And so we're just really hammering our streams when we have these storm events that hit the pavement in these developed areas. And then there's the water quality problem that comes along with it. So we've seen many studies that identify that stormwater is a likely cause of pre-spawn mortality of our salmon. Here's just a, a snippet of data looking at re the relationship between storms and flows and fish mortality. I'm not going to dwell on that, but there's a lot of evidence that our stormwater is a problem. And so how do we fix that? So we know we have a problem with our stormwater. And at the same time, we need to accommodate a lot of growth in our region. And so Puget Sound, and this really comes into play as we think about we're using development as a tool to improve our streams. And so we're targeting development in our urban centers, and that's where our streams are the most impacted, which means we're putting up most of our treatment and our flow control improvements in these urban centers on our most impacted streams. Looking forward, we know that the population in this area is going to grow dramatically. Uh, by 2040, we're expecting to see two more Seattles and two more Tacomas in population. And so we're squeezing all those people in, accommodating that with, with new development. And so those hydro hydrologic impacts are not going to get better from that activity. Regionally, the vision is to focus this development in these, these regional growth centers. And that helps protect the streams that are outside of those growth centers. As we think about the development that's happening, that's where our stormwater retrofits are going. And so we're, we're putting all of our retrofit resources in these urban streams that are the most impacted. So I'm going to move on and talk about what we're doing here in Redmond. Redmond, Washington is uh, just east of Seattle. 
Uh, we're about 17 square miles. Uh, we have about 60,000 people living here and about 85,000 here during the day. Uh, so a lot of people coming into town. Uh, we were built out in the, you know, really in the 70s through the 90s. And if you know stormwater, how stormwater codes have developed over time, stormwater controls in that time was, was almost nothing. So there's not a lot of stormwater ponds and vaults protecting our streams. And so as you would predict, our stormwater, our stormwater has caused a big impact on our urban streams. But Redmond's really committed to restoring those streams. Uh, the, the people here, we do surveys every once in a while asking what's important to Redmond residents, and we talk about uh, wanting to be clean and green. And although we have rapid redevelopment happening, it remains a really important thing for our, our residents to see the natural environment uh, continue in a positive way. But this is what our streams look like. So this, is a, this here is a picture of Tosh Creek. It's one of our better streams. And you can see that erosion cut that's been caused by high intensity flows uh, during storm events from highly impervious areas. So we see erosion, we see incised channels. Uh, from that we get poor water quality. The water quality and, and the hydrology causes problems with our benthic situation. The bugs that the fish want to eat are getting washed away or, or dying. And so our fish don't have a place to go. Uh, we also are seeing low base flows in response to all that development. And so you put all that together it's not a good situation uh, for our fish. But it's fairly typical as in ur urban streams in the Puget Sound. So a, a few years back, we embarked on this vision uh, to build a citywide watershed plan. And our general goals were to really understand our streams, then prioritize those streams uh, so that we could focus our restoration efforts where we thought we would make the most benefit, and identify a path forward to restore the prior streams in the most rapid way we could. And really the lofty goal is to restore all of our streams by 2060. So as we started up this watershed plan, we had some guiding principles. So one of our goals was that this watershed plan would address really multiple regulations. So there's a lot of overlapping regulations uh, in this region. So we have our NPDES stormwater permit. Uh, we have other NPDES permits in the city, industrial permits. We have Envir uh, Endangered Species Act obligations. Uh, there are TMDL requirements, and you pull all these things together, we want to have a plan that really puts it, gives us a clear guidance about what we should do, rather than having to look to a lot of different documents. One of the guiding principles is that we prevent new stormwater impacts everywhere. So as we think about focusing our efforts on specific targeted streams, we don't forget about the streams that maybe aren't a priority or are a lower priority. So we, it's important that we, we may be able to focus our improvements in certain areas but we don't want to create new impacts on any stream, really. So we wanted to create this citywide plan that will address both stormwater and environmental asset needs. Another guiding principle in Redmond was that for developers, we would make this uh, an optional program. We have specific requirements that apply to all developers, of course, but participation in this watershed plan that we're talking about, uh, there are optional elements. And so that's important. And these are those, those elements of the plan, again. So one of the things I didn't touch on is, is the partnerships that we had to develop. So as we developed this plan, you know, talk about the overlapping regulations. Certainly we had to sit down with the Washington State Department of Ecology and work with them closely on how we could implement this plan. We characterized the watersheds in the plan, set goals for future conditions, and then once we set the goals, then we identify some impl implementation steps, uh, watershed specific, throughout the city. And then as we implement, we want to monitor performance, and then we want to adaptively manage what we're doing. And, you know, take it, repeat the things that work well, and learn from the things that don't. So there's a lot to learn uh, in developing a watershed plan. And I, I think it's important to know that there's, there's a lot of information that we want to have to really understand what's going on in our streams. And most communities actually have most of this information. So you don't need to go and do a $2 million, $2 million study to figure out what to do with your streams. The first thing you should do is just draw on the information you have. I'd say most jurisdictions have a pretty good under handle on their topography, right? They have a pretty good handle on the soil types in their community. Uh, you can start with your USGS maps and SCS mapping and all of that. You can go a step further by looking at geotechnical reports from development that's happened in the, either on your capital projects or on your private development projects. Most communities have mapped their streams of course, you can't really prioritize your streams until you know something about them. So you need to know where they are, uh, what the conditions are, walk those streams. You need to understand your land use, both the existing land use and the, what the zoning is going to bring to an area. 
In Redmond, uh, wellhead protection zones are important. So we have municipal wells that we use as our drinking water resource here. And so we have additional requirements, kind of an overlay. And other communities will have other kinds of overlays that will drive, may drive their watershed planning process. And then, of course, knowing where your stormwater infrastructure is. Uh, you have to know where your pipes are, where are your ponds, where are your treatment facilities. These are things that our MPDS permits are requiring us to do. And so, again, as I said, a lot of this information is already, already here. And so you're able to build the beginning of a watershed plan just by having that collected information. To take things one step further, water quality data is really great to have. You know, what's the, what's the condition of the stream? And then where have you seen fish? Uh, there are lots of uh, fish monitoring programs out there, and so knowing what's going on there. Getting an understanding of the condition of the benthic invertebrates in your streams by collecting uh, BIBI data is a great step to, to take. And if you can do that in a number of streams, then you can get a handle on whether the, you know, these bugs, the fish food, are present. And you learn a lot about the health of the stream by knowing which of those bugs are, are there. And then the flow characteristics. Uh, you know, the baseline is to just walk that stream, look at, you know, you can make estimates of flows in the channel just by making observations and knowing where the, you know, what's the bank full depth and things like that. But you can also do continuous monitoring. There's a lot of different layers to how much investment a community needs to make or will make in doing a, this plan. Um, and, you know, more data is going to be better. But you should start with what you have. I would say most communities will find there's a lot of room to improve. So the maps that you see in front of you on the left is uh, flow control. So all of the dark areas represent areas of inadequate flow control. And you can see most of it's dark. Uh, let me just introduce you to the map that we're looking at. So down in the bottom right corner you see Lake Sammamish, that little bit of blue. Lake Sammamish drains uh, to the north and west into the Sammamish River. And then those, those pink outlined areas are the watersheds of the various streams that drain into the river. And then these dark brown areas you see are areas where we don't have adequate flow control. And we defined adequate flow control as flow control meeting the current stormwater standards. So you can see a lot of brown. Interestingly, we have a fair bit of area that's not brown right next to the river, and that's because uh, in Redmond that river doesn't require flow control, so we, we can say that it's adequate there. So you can really see the inadequacy of the, the development when you look at the treatment side on the right. So lots more brown there. And these are areas uh, within Redmond that do not have treatment that meets the current standards. And that's to be expected. As I mentioned, most of our development occurred back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And so there's a lot of room to improve. And so as we think about uh, watershed planning, we want to know what, where we've already built stuff, and that helps us understand what else uh, we can add. So once you've collected all this information about your streams, uh, it's time to start prioritizing the watersheds. And we used uh, a matrix like this one to divide the watersheds into different categories. So as you look at the, the green areas, the, the highest protection, so we think about where, which streams are, have a lot going for them. And so you would think of these as kind of forested areas. And on, on the map on the right, uh, there's a Mackie Creek watershed and there's a Seidel Creek watershed, and each of those are green. And they're basically forested areas that have been set aside. These are areas where it doesn't make sense to put a lot of money into those streams because they're in great shape. And so we're not going to target investments there. At the other end of the scale, uh, we have areas of very high degradation and, and low level of importance. And they're kind of the pink or the red uh, watersheds. So these are areas that we can't let them get worse. But if we're going to target investment, this isn't the place that we would do it. And so you see a number of kind of these pink and red watersheds on this map as well. Moving up the scale into the orange areas, we call that restoration development. These are watersheds that we will get to after we've completed work in our priority watersheds. And that brings us to the yellow ones, the highest restoration. So these are watersheds that we want to target as places where we will do, we'll target most of our restoration efforts. Tosh Creek and Kleist Creek and Evans Creek and Bear Creek. Uh, these are watersheds where the, the BIBI scores maybe are in the poor to fair, and we like to get them uh, moved up toward good. And so we, if we, we think that if we build some stormwater facilities, some retrofits in those watersheds, that we'll see that improvement in a more rapid time than if we start putting money in those pink areas. And so you start to see that by prioritizing our investments, 
now we're able to you know, see some improvements in a particular stream much more rapidly than we would if the developers get to choose. The developer might decide they want to build in the Villa Marina Creek watershed on here. And that's really important for their development, but we've decided that that's a stream that we're not going to get a lot of return on an investment there. And so if we can transfer some of that investment elsewhere, that'll be better for the overall stream health in the city. So these are kind of summarizes our approach. The priority watersheds, as I've said, the yellow ones, uh, those, they're areas of fairly moderate impairment that have the highest potential for rehabilitation. So we'll go ahead and, and we'll build some facilities to improve things, hydrology and water quality. And our goal is to build some facilities and then allow developers to pay a fee in lieu of building things on some of their own properties. And there's a lot of limitations, and I'll, I'll go into that. But one of the keys is that we don't make anything worse. So we don't let that developer, I mentioned Villa, Mar Villa Marina Creek. We don't let a developer there trash that stream so that he can in invest in improving Tosh Creek next door. But we might let him make it not a lot better, just kind of maintain the status quo. So this is just a simple graphic that I wanted to show to illustrate this, how we might transfer things from one site to another. So if you think of a typical existing site, maybe it's a one-acre development where you know, half of it is impervious area. So that gray is kind of an impervious area, and the rest of it's a forested condition. In the, the standard development plan, if we just follow our NPDES permit to the letter exactly as it's written, the developer for this project might be planning to add additional impervious. And so there's more impervious on this site. And there's a bunch of green space that's go going away. But the stormwater requirement to protect the stream asks the developer to not just protect that site for the impervious area that's the developer's required to make the streams that it drains to think that the site is still in that existing condition or even better in a forested condition. And so what we're what the developer will do is build a giant stormwater pond on the property and that will have a release rate that makes all that impervious area drain away as if it's a forested site and it's a fully forested site. What the watershed plan does is it allows us to, if we're in a basin that's not as high a priority, we'd look at that site a little bit differently. So the portions of the site that were impervious before, kind of that existing condition, we're going to let the stream think that impervious area is still there. So we're not going to make it worse, because uh, the stream already thinks of that impervious area as being there. And we'll take the money that the developer would use to invest in restoring that impervious area to a forested condition, take some of that money to invest in another site in a priority watershed. The developer would still need to build a pond because he's increasing the impervious on the site and needs to offset for the impacts of the forest area that's going away as part of the project. So that's kind of the watershed plan approach. We're, we're taking that difference between the standard approach, so he's building a little bit less, but he's taking the money he would have spent on that large pond and contributing it to this priority watershed. So this is looking at Redmond again. So we've zoomed in on a portion of Redmond. You can see the Lake Sammamish there on the bottom right draining into the river. And that pink area is a target watershed in the city. In this case, it's, it's the Tosh Creek watershed. So this is a, identified as a priority. It's one of those yellow watersheds that we had mentioned. Our watershed planning approach then would be that we would go into this targeted watershed and we would build a stormwater retrofit project. Uh, maybe we build a giant stormwater vault here to improve flows in the stream. And so we've made an investment in the stream uh, working toward improving things. We maybe we do another project. We start hopefully we start to see some improvements happening in the stream. And now that we've built some projects, uh, we are in a position where we can start accepting money to help fund future projects. And so here we have the red box on the right there is a development site. And this development site drains into a different watershed. Uh, looks like it drains into that Villa Marina Creek watershed. Instead of investing money in, in that, we'll invest that into the Tosh Creek. So we collect that money, and we're able to repay the investment the city made to building those green projects, and then we're able to uh, do more. And so the, I just another project pops up over on, across the way. And by taking those developer investments, we raise enough money to build another project. And so now we're starting to see, hopefully, we, we see some improvements in the Tosh Creek watershed. We see the hydraulics starting to improve, our water quality is, is improving and as we build these projects. And we just keep going. And as we keep going, we create more opportunities for developers to contribute. And so that development's able to proceed. And ultimately, we're able to build enough retrofit projects to meet our goal of fully restoring the stream.
and then we move on to the next watershed. And someday we'll move on to those watersheds that those developments have been in, but will be might might be a little while. So as we developed our watershed plan, uh, ecology was also created a watershed characterization model. And we were gratified to find that the way that they approached characterizing the watersheds aligned very well with what we were doing. You know, their approach covered all of Western Washington, but it, it aligned very well with our local analysis. And so and they have guidance available for that. So once you've developed your general watershed plan, you need to start thinking about implementation. So first, we had to get approval for this watershed approach. I mentioned before, we worked with the various agencies to get approvals there, but we also brought it through our city council and got the regulatory framework in place uh, within our, our city codes to allow this watershed approach. You see the picture of the Tosh Creek watershed here. The step after your citywide watershed plan where you've prioritized your streams is to then develop a, a basin-specific implementation plan. Identify really what are the needs that the stream has. So one, one stream may have a real hydrology problem, so your, your focus may be on building some retrofit vaults. Another project may have a really poor base flow condition, so maybe you're looking at trying to find infiltration opportunities, low impact development retrofits, or you have a water quality problem. And so finding the, you know, kind of what are the limiting conditions in, in your stream help you identify what projects you can build. I mentioned before kind of guiding principles here. We're going to try to address new storm stormwater impacts close to the site, but existing impacts uh, we can move to these priority areas. And then one thing I, I, that's important to note is besides the developers buying into these programs, city capital projects can also participate. So moving forward, we don't just keep a, a big map with green blobs and red blobs moving, moving around on the screen to track what's going on. Uh, it's really important to, as you develop this plan, to avoid the pitfall of collecting money from a developer uh, without a clear plan of how you're going to spend it. So you, you'll notice that our plan, uh, our objective is to build retrofit projects first, and then we can start recouping some of those costs from developers. And you have to track how the money is coming in and, and how it's being spent. And as we think about the money, there's kind of a currency that we develop in our plan for, for these benefits. So as we think about flow control, for example, we're trying to provide flow control that meets the current flow control standard. And so a developer might have an acre that's part of their project that they can identify an acre of land that is eligible for this program. They can pay for that acre of development, and then we would accept that money, and we will we'll have to confirm that we have developed a registered project in a priority basin that provides an equivalent acre of flow control. And we, we may do the same thing with water quality. And so as we think about water quality, we get very specific. We talk about meeting basic treatment standards, enhanced treatment or phosphorus control or things like that, really separate those out or maybe even limit it and just focus on, on meeting basic treatment standards. And so it's just area for area is kind of the currency that we track. We need to know how we're doing. So we have to continue monitoring. We have to monitor these streams. Uh, it's good to have a baseline condition so you know what your investments are buying. And so we, we need a, a robust monitoring program. And hopefully what you see is you build a big flow control facility and you start to see the, you see the hydrology improvement and the water quality gets better as you stop the erosion and the benthics come back and the fish come back. Part of your implementation is your funding strategy. So a great resource is grants. So the Washington State Department of Ecology offers a lot of great stormwater retrofit grants. And so that's a great way to kick off a program like this so you can help build that, that first project. Of course, they require a match. And really, your city needs to make an investment in, in the watershed restoration. So the, the starting point is grants. And in Redmond's case, it's our stormwater capital improvement program, building these retrofit projects to get the ball rolling. Once you've got that ball rolling, you can start to accept developer contributions and kind of pay it forward. One more piece of that implementation, it's really important to ensure that you have strong public support for these investments in the environment. Uh, I think we've learned that as you prepare to do a restoration project, uh, maybe a, build a vault in an established neighborhood, it's really important to have a strong message so that people really understand why you're doing what you're doing. You know, I, th I think we've learned that most people think that it's great to restore streams and improve fish, but once that bulldozer is parked in their driveway, they're maybe less supportive. These retrofit projects can be really challenging, so you need to really work hard at the beginning to garner that public support. And since watershed planning takes some time, you should start doing that early in that watershed approach so that when you get to the point of building these retrofit projects, you've built that strong base of public support. I mentioned monitoring. The monitoring approach that we're using here, we have divided some of our streams into different categories, as I mentioned before. The table in front of you, first two rows, are the reference streams. 
So Collin Creek and Seidel Creek are those green blobs that you saw on the map before. So these are our pristine, we want to restore these streams. These are not places we would make an investment. And so we're going to monitor these streams to show hopefully that they're, they're doing great, uh, that they're not in decline. This is kind of what we hope to get to. At the bottom of the table, we have some control watersheds. So Tyler's Creek and Country Creek. So these are watersheds that are not our, on our priority list. Uh, maybe they're not, they're not the worst streams in the city, but they're maybe not on the, they're kind of the orange ones in that map from before. And so these uh, lower priority streams are places where we're not building retrofit projects. And so we would expect that these streams are going to stay pretty much the same. Maybe we'll see some decline as time goes on because they are impacted urban streams. And then we're going to also monitor the priority watersheds. And so here we call them application watersheds, Tosh, Evans, and Monticello. In these areas, we're building retrofit projects, and our expectation is that we see improvement to those co the conditions in those streams. There's a lot to monitor to really show a, a, in a robust way that you're making an improvement. With this study, we're monitoring you know, a dozen stormwater flows annually. Uh, we're monitoring base flow events and collecting water quality data. We're walking the streams. We're also doing hydrologic monitoring. That's continuous flow monitoring in the channel. We're looking at the sediment, we're looking at the, the benthics, and looking for fish presence. All these things are really important as we move forward so that hopefully we can demonstrate that we're seeing some improvements in the channel. Andy Rayum, who helped to develop the watershed plan, or led the watershed plan, I should say, uh, just joined me, and we're open for questions. First question, what was your biggest hurdle in convincing managers to adopt a watershed approach, and how did you solve it? Uh, this is Andy Rayum. So the, I guess the, the unique thing that we had going on here is that we had for years discussed doing watershed planning, and so it was in our Growth Management Act required comprehensive plan that we that was a, a goal of ours and a strategy of ours to in, to meet our vision of the city in the future. So wasn't a whole lot of debate, I guess, at that point when you point that out to people uh, in management that it's actually a directive of the of the city in the city councils. But if you don't have that option available to you, um, I think the, the big selling point would be to be efficient, to create a plan for a future utility that makes sense. Instead of just following development around randomly, you could actually try to get at the intent of the regulations versus just, just meeting them. So I don't know, those are just some additional selling points. But for the most part, I, I think um, Anybody that's pretty reasonable would understand why you, you would want to do this. I guess just another quick sidebar is that it's important for cities and counties to actually consider the stream itself an asset to the city or county. And I don't think that's typically the uh, the norm. But if you, if you do take that kind of philosophy or, or um, commitment that those are actually assets and you want to preserve them and protect them, that it definitely changes kind of the, how cities and counties address them because then all of a sudden it's a it's a thing and it needs to be maintained, it needs to be protected, it needs to be, you know, to, to take care of it. What were your four funding sources for all the monitoring? So we, the paired watershed studies, so there's a, a regional called the Stormwater Actions Monitoring. It used to be the Regional Stormwater Monitoring Program. It's the part of the Stormwater Work Group. I don't know there's a whole bunch of names there, but basically what it means is that the, um, all the permittees, permittees contributed to this effectiveness monitoring pooled resource, and this was easily the largest project and the longest uh, longest term project. But we got 100% funding from that the stormwater work group slash stormwater action monitoring program. So that that is the only source of funding that we have for it, rather than internal you know funding for su supporting the program here. We we don't take we don't actually get any money. Uh, locally, we, we fund all of our staff time in that in that program internally. So additionally, we I think like many communities, just developing the watershed plan, we also did a lot of monitoring up front. And, and that monitoring all came from really from our stormwater CIP. So it's really just making that, in, that investment in understanding what's going on in your stream so you can figure out where to, where to, where to improve. Assuming adequate treatment and flow control for all new development, what kind of margin are you expecting to be directed to your priority restoration streams? So in Redmond, a lot of the cities that are in these urban centers that are seeing a lot of development, most of the development that we see is redevelopment. As we look at that, the slide that I presented, I was trying to, to show kind of that difference between a new development project that maybe wipes out a forest to build a new parking lot 
or versus what we see here in Revenue more typically is a parking lot that gets wiped out to put in a new building. The incremental impact on that stream that you might see from that, that parking lot that's turning into a building, it actually might improve things as the water quality improves and things like that. There's a large opportunity on a project like that to take that investment somewhere else and just let, let the, exist, the stream that it drains to continue to think that that parking lot's there and, and move on. Just that difference between new development and redevelopment. And if you're in a community with mostly new development where you're taking away existing landscape or existing forest and pasture, uh, you're not going to have much margin to work with. But a redeveloping area like Seattle, like Seattle or Tacoma or Redmond, there's lots of redevelopment projects that have that opportunity. And just, just to tack on real quick, I've talked to quite a few counties lately, especially the phase ones, the NPDES stormwater permit phase one counties. And, you know, a stormwater control transfer program might not be a good fit for them because of what Steve just explained that, you know, usually out in the county, you, you knock a forest down to build a development. And so all controls would have to be built on that site. So they don't have the, it's not as, as um, opportunistic, I would say, as, as a city or as, especially a city with a regional growth center. So, so I can see Heidi's asked the question, uh, were there any difficulties in using the Puget Sound watershed characterization tool? And I'm going to let Andy answer that question. They actually, the state did ran the model for us. We used, um, they had smaller, so the, the, the current run that they have up on their website is, is rather large areas. So we're talking about catchments between two and 500 acres in size. So they did have a layer for that and they were able to run it uh, more. They did a, a run of their model just for the city of Redmond um, watersheds. And yeah, it was free. Uh, it didn't take much time. Um, they were very... They were very happy, actually, that uh, somebody was interested in having them run the model for their own local use. I think we were one of the first that actually did that. So I, I, it's not a big deal. Um, I don't know if Humes is going to want to kill me for saying that, but I would, I would contact them and see if they're interested in running the model for you. What departments or other agencies did you collaborate with during the characterization phase? Second part of the question is, are there others you should have brought in if you could have? So I think that the, to answer the first part of the question, the characterization phase, I think we were basically 100% in-house on that. Characterization meaning, I, I'm assuming that's what you, were, what you mean is that we're collecting the data and trying to figure out which data sets we needed to try to then look at which, which streams are a priority versus other streams. And I, I kind of get what you're saying because that does get, that can get politically heated, like if you were... Um, you know, a, guy, a person that lives near a stream that you know is, is not a high priority, you would be perhaps frustrated because somebody else is going to see investments in the stream that's near their house that's not near yours. Uh, we, we haven't encountered that um, yet. I think that one of, the, one of the maybe upshots of, I'm always a big advocate for if you have groups of people that want to work on this stuff, that's fantastic. We, out in Redmond, you don't have a whole lot of people that are super interested in the level of detail that it, that it takes to characterize a stream. So we, we, we did that kind of in, a, not in isolation, but we did it in kind of an empirical way. So we really just looked at the data set and we didn't try to build a matrix to weight different things different ways or anything like that. You just, literally, we looked at almost raw data or summaries of data so that we could see it all together. And it was clear. It became clear, at least to me and other people that worked on it, like which, which streams make the most sense to try to get that ecological lift. I know it's the, almost an overused term at this point, but out of, out of an investment in your stormwater system and, and in stream and habitat. And then, so I just wanted to add, so the questions regarding the characterization phase, which is developing the kind of the citywide watershed plan. But the next element is the watershed or the, you know, the local watershed implementation phase and developing that plan for just the watershed. And so, in, in that step, it's really important to engage the community there. So, you know, an example of something that we might do is ask everybody in the neighborhood to tell us if they've got a sump pump in their house so that we can understand where there's, you know, where there's water uh, coming out of the ground instead of the other way to help us understand the kind of practices we might be able to implement. And, and then, again, another really important thing is to get people engaged early to start to understand you might be want to build a big project on their street. And so getting some people to, as, as you start identifying projects, letting them have an opportunity to weigh in on, on those things is really important. What are the next steps? That's A. And then following that, are there 
future plans to allow you to compare the value of one project over another within a priority watershed. Our next steps, it's really the implementation phase. So the, the monitoring is underway, so we have some good baseline data. And Andy keeps telling me to get busy building a retrofit project so we have some benefits to show in our priority watersheds. And we're working toward that, but, you know, getting getting those grants and, you know, building that first project. In Redmond, we're, we, we've developed one implementation plan and we're, we're working on a second implementation plan. And we are doing a, a process of comparing one project over another. And they're really different kinds of projects. I think each stream that we've looked at is very different. When we started, we, we thought, well, these streams are, we look at these two priority watersheds, uh, Tosh Creek and Monticello Creek in Redmond, and they're, on the face of it, they look very similar. There's similar areas, the development's not that different, but we go to Tosh Creek and we find that we have amazing base flows, more than you'd expect to see in a stream uh, of this size, and nobody can really explain why. When we go to Monticello and um, and we see we have a lot of stormwater ponds. The kinds of solutions that we're looking at in these two watersheds are, are dramatically different. In Tosh Creek, we found that what we're, our limiting condition there is, uh, you know, we're looking at pulse counts. And hydrology is the, the very first thing that we're trying to target. And so as we compare one project to another, we prioritized a large volume detention that would improve a particular tributary on a particular part of the stream. And so every stream is going to be very unique, and your criteria then are also going to be very uh, unique to that stream. I'm going to thank Steve and Andy for a great presentation.